Questions Q&A. I look now at academic freedom and diversity on college campuses. Hosted by the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, panelists include a documentary filmmaker, also authors and professors from Yale University and the Universities of Michigan and Chicago. This is about 90 minutes. Okay, good evening everyone. I guess it's evening time now that the sun is setting so early. Uh, for those of you that don't know me, I'm Neil Gooderman. I'm the Dean of the School of Social Service Administration here at the University of Chicago. And I want to thank you uh, for joining us uh, for this evening's event. American universities have long been unique institutions that generate novel, sometimes controversial, and even iconoclastic ideas that will challenge or sometimes uh, press popular wisdom, bringing to bear deeper, more rigorous analyses and evidence. Uh, such ideas can at times fuel advances or even breakthroughs on the most vexing questions and intractable problems of our day. One of the most indispensable pillars in higher education which makes such advances wholly possible is the cardinal principle and practice of academic freedom, the protection of and the unfettered pursuit of ideas, concepts, evidence, and knowledge, and the passing on of such in our education of students. While the principle of academic freedom is a central feature of American higher education, the University of Chicago has a rather distinctive and deeply held approach to academic freedom, and which I'm sure you will be hearing more about this evening from some of our panelists. The School of Social Service Administration, as a professional school of social work, uh, particularly benefits from and contributes to academic freedom and the unfettered pursuit of ideas. Ideas that address the concerns of those who are most vulnerable and marginalized. We at SSA dive into and address the most complicated, multi-layered, and sometimes contentious of social problems like poverty or violence. And we do so in a tireless search for a real solutions uh, and to rigorously educate for social equity and justice. The ideas that we develop and discuss at SSA don't just stay among scholars and students here at the university, of course, but they're developed and delivered uh, to have real tangible benefit to people and their lives. Because our scholarship and education at SSA are intimately connected to real people and real world problem solving, SSA is oftentimes um, sort of a crucible of ideas and implications in the best sense of the word, where we're constantly searching for, to forge greater insight and light and enduring solutions out of what is oftentimes the heat of polarized, oversimplified, or not well-tested ideas and strategies. A second pillar found broadly in American higher education is a cardinal value on diversity. That is our value on bringing to the university community individuals from different backgrounds, life experiences, and statuses, and especially so for those from underrepresented or marginalized backgrounds. Of course, part of the importance of diversity stems from a value on social equity and societal inclusion, as universities are arguably the most important institutions in our society which foster entry into and integration in the mainstream. An additional indispensable component of diversity is that by bringing together diverse members to the university community, all of its members are enriched by the mutual exposure to divergent experiences, backgrounds, and viewpoints. In this way, our cardinal value on diversity is closely intertwined and a complementary branch from the same tree as academic freedom. As bringing to universities divergent experiences and viewpoints brings with it the questioning of assumptions and the challenging of conventional 
or prevailing ideas. And again, at the University of Chicago, and in particular at SSA, this value is especially central and distinctive, given that we're, as a professional school of social work, at core concerned with such questions as inclusion and access and reaching grounded understandings of and effective service to those who are most marginalized. Because of our core values on ideas that serve, SSA is very much at a nexus point on conversations about the complementary values of academic freedom and diversity. And it's for these very reasons that I'm especially delighted that SSA is hosting this evening's panel of four distinguished thought leaders on this topic. For this, I especially want to thank uh, SSA professors Gina Samuels and Marcy Barra for their vision and initiative and work with my office in pulling together this evening's panel, as well as to thank SSA's Committee on Inclusion, Equity, and Diversity for co-sponsoring this evening's event. Professor Samuels will be joining us up at the microphone in just a few moments to introduce the panelists to you this evening and will moderate the event. Before she does that, though, I also want to take this opportunity to thank University of Chicago President Bob Zimmer, who has provided his sage vision and leadership on this issue here at the University of Chicago and indeed nationally. And for that, I'd like to invite him up now to offer some welcome comments for this evening's event. Bob? Thank you very much, uh, Neil, and let me say how much I appreciate uh, the idea that SSA is uh, hosting this panel and hosting this discussion on, um, on this topic. Uh, the topic, uh, joint topics, I should say, of academic freedom, which I like thinking about a bit more generally as academic freedom and its companion, free expression, and diversity, which I also like thinking about a bit more broadly as diversity. Uh, and inclusion are two uh, core issues for uh, any university, and um, particularly so for uh, the University of Chicago. Uh, Neil described, I think, very beautifully uh, why these are uh, so important. Uh, I might just offer um, my own uh, uh, take on this, which is um, to start, uh, universities are not just a, a random collection of people who are here doing what they feel like doing. Uh, universities are institutions with very clear mission. Uh, that mission is a mission of education, uh, it's a mission of research, and it's a mission of finding vehicles for the impact of that education and research. Uh, if we are going to do our students uh, justice, do them well by the education that we provide them. If we're going to have an environment in which our faculty can, in fact, uh, explore their ideas to the fullest and prepare themselves uh, to have the greatest impact, uh, an environment of academic freedom and free expression is critical. It, it is simply a core to the functioning of the uh, university in fulfilling its core missions. Uh, in a similar way, uh, the issue of diversity inclusion becomes absolutely central to the university uh, for two reasons that Neil alluded to. Uh, first of all, uh, if one is going to be engaged in rigorous analysis and inquiry, having a bunch of people all from the same background, uh, similar perspectives sitting around, uh, fundamentally agreeing with each other but arguing only at the margins uh, is not the way to actually uh, make a serious advance and it's not the way to create an environment of intellectual challenge uh, for our students and to fulfill their education. Uh, so diversity of perspectives, uh, backgrounds, beliefs, and so on uh, becomes crucial to creating the environment for the kind of rigorous analysis that underlies the success of university. There is another reason that uh, diversity and inclusion is so important, and that uh, goes beyond the university itself, which is that uh, university is, does not exist in isolation. It exists in a societal context, and it exists in a history. Uh, it's no surprise uh, to anyone uh, that the history of really all countries, but the very particularly uh, this country, uh, has an enormous amount of exclusionary behavior built in uh, to its history. Uh, we have um, 
therefore a dual obligation, an obligation as uh, fulfilling our own mission uh, 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 and bringing those diverse perspectives to bear in a non-exclusionary way, but we also have, uh, have an obligation as, um, as an important member uh, of society to deal with the uh, particular history of this country and uh, the exclusionary aspects that uh, have been involved in it. And I think uh, Neil articulated the, uh, the meaning of, uh, of SSA uh, very uh, nicely in terms of uh, doing that from the point of view of SSA's con concrete mission, but I think the university as a whole itself has an obligation in that direction. Now some people have argued that these two issues are in conflict to some extent, that academic freedom and free expression on one hand and diversity and inclusion uh, on the other hand are in conflict. Uh, saying that there's no tension between them would be disingenuous. Saying that there's a fundamental underlying conflict between them is something I actually do not believe. I believe they're mutually reinforcing, but that one needs to recognize that there are in fact tensions and there are tensions that uh, need to be worked out. But anything less than an aspiration to fully embrace uh, both of these uh, values is, um, is failing ourselves uh, as an institution. Uh, the discussion uh, tonight, uh, I'm sure, will uh, look at these issues in uh, considerably more detail than the quick gloss that uh, both Neil and I uh, have, uh, have given them. Uh, I think the reason that we're able to uh, have such a discussion goes back to exactly what Neil was saying. It's an example of the uh, power and importance of open discourse and rigorous analysis and, um, and free expression. So I just want to again thank uh, Neil, uh, thank the faculty uh, here at uh, SSA for organizing this, and uh, I'm sure you're going to have a uh, fascinating evening. So thank you very much. Thank you, President Zimmer. So my name is Gina Miranda Samuels, and I will be the moderator this evening. And I will take several roles that I will explain in just a moment. Um, I would also like to welcome all of you here this evening, this afternoon, and extend a special thanks to my faculty and staff colleagues for their support and work. And I have to say I'm quite humbled to see that we are at standing room only. So thank you for coming. Special thanks to Dean Guterman for being so supportive of our organizing this, to the Committee on Inclusion, Equity, and Diversity, for their co-sponsorship, and in particular to my colleague Marcy Ibarra, who couldn't have done it without you, Marcy. Finally, I extend a special gratitude to the SSA community and others of you in attendance here tonight. The success of this dialogue and our exemplary practice of free expression tonight deeply rests with each of you, and I will explain that a little bit more in a moment. We will proceed by my giving a brief introduction to this panel, and then I will introduce each of the panelists. They will each talk for about 10 minutes. Um, I will then pose a question to them. We probably won't get, I've given them four questions, but I think that's a bit ambitious, and we will probably get through one or two. And then I will um, transition us to the evening um, informal event, which will involve an informal dialogue amongst all of us. So a bit of a social experiment is to come. So in 1915, the American Association of University Professors advanced a declaration of principles that laid the foundation for much of today's legal and tacit understanding of academic freedom and tenure within institutions of higher education. However, the University of Chicago, as President Zimmer and Dean Guterman both mentioned, represent a unique brand of academic freedom. And, and we were deeply and publicly shaping and advancing these ideas long before the 1915 statement. Most recently in 2014, President Zimmer and then Provost Isaacs formed a special committee on freedom of expression. Chaired by one of our panelists, Professor Jeff Stone, it restates the university's enduring commitment to the free exchange of ideas and a resolute core principle and value here at this institution. 
President Zimmer has already referenced this history in his opening marks, and I'm sure that Professors Boyer and Stone will likely discuss this in their and their leadership in our university's contemporary practice of this value in their individual remarks. For the contemporary university, however, debates do persist around the very meaning and limits of academic freedom in the context of growing diversity on campus and attunement to a campus climate that is not only inclusive of a diverse set of ideas, but also of a demographically diverse student, staff, and faculty body. This year, the University of Chicago Dean of Students in the College, Jay Ellison, issued a welcome statement to first-year students reaffirming our university's long-standing institutional commitment to academic freedom and as such, institutional rejection of silencing or avoiding uncomfortable or disagreeable ideas and perspectives. This was paired with the idea that faculty are not required to create safe spaces nor issue trigger warnings. This statement was met with vigorous national and local response, both affirming and contesting these views and more deeply positioning University of Chicago itself as an iconic symbol and defender of the unfettered practice of academic freedom. This afternoon is a time for us as a university community to engage with each other and fully practice this freedom. It is my hope that we all deepen our understanding of and ability to critically consider the diversity of ways in which this value is interpreted and practiced. Now I would like to just briefly introduce our expert panel. We are deeply honored and excited to have each one of you here. Each of our panelists, you should know, is a distinguished scholar in their own right, and time does not permit me to go over all of their many accomplishments, so I apologize in advance, but we will stick to names and affiliations so that we have time to hear their thoughts. To my far left is Professor John Boyer, Dean, University of Chicago College, Martin A. Ryerson, Distinguished Service Professor in History. Next is Professor Jeff Stone, Edward H. Levi, Distinguished Professor, Service Professor at the University of Chicago's Law School. Next is Professor Zarina Graywall, Associate Professor, Departments of American Studies and Religious Studies and the Program in Ethnicity, Race, Migration, from Yale University. And last but not least, Professor Lorraine Gutierrez, Professor of Social Work, University of Michigan School of Social Work, Arthur F. Thurneau Professor, Professor of Psychology, College of Literature, Science, and the Arts, and the inaugural director of the University of Michigan School of Social Work's Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Initiative. And with that, I would love for us to begin, Professor Boyer, with you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I thought I would just talk a little bit about two subjects that are, uh, are of some interest to me. I, I became interested in the subject of academic freedom as a, uh, uh, from a scholarly perspective and also from an academic administrative perspective at, at the same time. Um, and about 14, 15 years ago, I published a small history of the idea of academic freedom as practiced at the University of Chicago. And I came to write that book because of the um, – the, there, there were a number of currents uh, uh, abroad in the land, as it were, involving the – the kind of backlash or, uh, or, or reaction to some significant changes we had made in our core curriculum uh, at the time. And um, there were some lobbying groups, uh, petitions being formed, uh, coming from rather different ideological directions, but all of which were attempting to influence, in some ways, pressure the faculty to either reverse the changes or to, uh, uh, or to modify the changes, and, and also to change the content of new courses that had been developed in the context of these changes. And I became very concerned about this as a, um, uh, 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 as a kind of an episode, small but not insignificant episode, in the kind of long history of academic freedom as it occurred on university. So I began to, I thought I should maybe I'd take a look at this, the broader history. And so I wrote this book, which is now available online. Uh, subsequently, there have been other episodes, uh, and, and uh, actually all too, too many in many regards of faculty being criticized for things that they write, students being criticized for things that they would say. And so that this is a, certainly a live issue and, a, and, a, and one that is, uh, bears contemporary um, introspection and, con and concern. I want to say two things about it. First of all, uh, from the point of view of the, uh, of, of the history of the university, I, I published last year a, um, a kind of family-sized history of the University of Chicago, which is, uh, I'm not going to talk about that. It's available in the bookstore. Um, as a, that's a plug, by the way. Um, uh, 
But I, I do want to draw from that, uh, the, uh, to stress something that I think is relatively unique about Chicago, not totally unique, but relatively unique, and that is the impact of the European context, um, the, the ambient context of European higher education and its influence on, uh, on the University of Chicago. Um, the, uh, uh, I think this is very important because the, the idea of academic freedom, or what the Germans would call Lehrfreiheit and Lernfreiheit, um, these represented a bundle of concepts that were practiced, and vigorously contested, vigorously fought over, and, and, and defended, and, 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 um, and, and, and criticized within the larger uh, context of the modern German research university, particularly the universities of Berlin, Munich, Leipzig, Vienna, the big, you know, big four in, in German higher education in the 19th century. Many of our, the founding faculty at, at this university were trained at these universities or had studied at them. Uh, if only for a short time, but at least a, a, a enough time to be able to draw from inspiration and values and ideals from the, from the practice of uh, academic freedom uh, within the senior faculty of these great German and uh, Austrian universities. Uh, these were uh, ideas that were, uh, uh, in a sense, rather strange for the Americans to comprehend because these were state universities. Um, the faculty were civil servants. They were paid, actually, in some ways, to do the state's bidding. But the state or the states had decided that the bidding that they were to do had to do with the advancement of knowledge and the creation of, of, uh, of original research as a national cultural product, uh, project. And so that the, in some ways, there was a, an initial homogenizing, a tendency to create a homogeneous culture of thought because this was for the good of the state, but on the other hand, in order to create the, this, this ambient culture of new knowledge, one had to allow and permit the faculty to have the freedom to do it. And so there was an already built into the whole assumption of academic freedom a, a paradox that in order to be perfectly conformist, in order to be perfectly, uh, as it were, supporting the state's project of cultural renewal, one had to be perfectly free. And, and so this tension was really embedded from the very beginning in, 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 in this model that the, these young Americans uh, 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 observed, partook of, and then wanted to copy and, and, and bring over to the United States. And they did this in a very, um, very powerful way. Uh, many of our most distinguished faculty were trained in Germany, um, and they, they, they really self-consciously sought to model themselves as German ordinarian, as German full professors or German senior associate professors, not only in the pursuit of knowledge and research, but also in the way that they uh, understood their rights, their responsibilities, the, the esteem, the, the pride that, they, that their, their work would carry, carry, carry with it. And a central concept of this professional maturity, this professional pride was the idea of being free, being able, not only free within the classroom, but also free within the broader civic realm. That one was not, not simply a private citizen confined to being free within one's class, but also one was a private citizen who could speak one's, uh, one's uh, uh, opinion broadly uh, within the, the, uh, the, the broader civic universe. Um, Within Chicago's history, uh, the, the, this was uh, the, the idea of academic freedom then became part of a bundle of concepts that uh, Harper and the founding faculty used to reimagine what a university was. It ceased to be a training institution. It ceased to be a preparatory school. It became a, a site for the advancement of scholarship. And not only did the faculty embrace this uh, in their own realm, but they also then began to understand the, their mission as teachers using the same concept because if, if, if they were faculty, if they were scholars, then, then what their job, really their primary job, all due respect for you know, the undergraduate education, it was really to train future scholars. And so the students, in a sense, became proto-scholars involved in the same universe of discourse involving academic freedom. These ideas did not emerge uncontested. Um, and with our, in our university, there, are, there was the Bemis case, there, was a, there were other cases, the Ross case out at Stanford, the Eli, uh, Richard Eli, Eli case in, in Wisconsin, in which uh, faculty, uh, by their actions within the university or in the broader civic realm, tested the actual willingness of the universities themselves and their patrons, their philanthropists, uh, 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 in the case of the public university state government, to actually tolerate the kind of academic, the claims to academic freedom that the faculty were had, had taken upon themselves. Um, and one finds very similar um, controversies in, in Germany. I, I, I've written extensively about one, probably the most famous co controversy actually occurred in Vienna, not in Berlin, called the Wahlmut affair, in which this was a classic case of um, everyone publicly agreeing on the virtues of academic freedom, but everyone publicly disagreeing about where the limits were and about um, 
uh, uh, just how much political capital the political parties, the state, the churches were willing to put in play to actually defend the professors who were claiming that freedom. Uh, I also want to mention that the, 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 within the history of higher education in Europe, it's during this period, 1890 to 1914, that one begins to find very powerful voices emerging among the professoriate uh, articulating um, what this meant, uh, what, the, what these ideas meant, uh, not only uh, for the individual faculty member of the university as a corporation. Max Weber, the German, famous German sociologist, was probably the most uh, eloquent in this regard. Weber's essays and his letters and his commentaries on academic freedom emerge in this period in which these universities are struggling both with the wealth that they had assembled and the cultural power and the mission that they had assembled and had been given to them by the state, but also then the, the desire of the faculty to pull back and to say, no, we're not the state's agents. We are different from the state. We are not the church's agents. We are not uh, 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 agents of, uh, of, of political parties. We are, we are our, own, uh, our own persons, um, and yet we're being paid for by the state. And how, how does one, um, how does one um, uh, assess those, those boundaries? Uh, the second point I want to make, is, and so the, the argument I want to make uh, in the first instance is that the, I think probably more than any of the other great American universities, certainly uh, the new universities, the other new universities, uh, Chicago was very much, uh, 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 the, the faculty culture was a culture that emerged and, and became mature and became independent, feeling itself uh, uh, as almost a bearer of these, these great European and German ideas. And the, um, the absence of a kind of uh, philanthropy, Mr. Rockefeller, our founder, was actually rather abstemious. He didn't meddle, as happened in other universities, with the faculty's rights. So it was very easy for the faculty to come to feel themselves not only to be theoretically free, but practically free. And the practice of these values and these identities uh, uh, over time, really within 20 to 30 years, had set and gelled. And it's this uh, culture that Robert Hutchins, who is probably our most eloquent defender of fr academic freedom, and Jeff has cited uh, uh, Hutchins in several of the uh, things that he's written. Hutchins, uh, Hutchins was able to do what he did and to defend the values of academic freedom because he had a faculty culture that could back him up and sustain it. Hutchins' work makes no sense at all, makes no sense at all to me in, in the context, except in the context of a faculty culture that was already shaped and fully dedicated and, and assimilated these ideas. Um, in, a, uh, in a very powerful way and internalize them uh, 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 for, for, for their own purposes. I want to make a second uh, set of comments, and that's the impact on the community. The, the, um, um, the, um, I've argued that the, the, the practice of academic freedom has become a, uh, it's a signpost uh, or, or find signs of it throughout the history of the university, but it, it it gels and it becomes particularly intense, I'd say, between about 1900 and 1920. Um, this has a profound effect on the kind of student culture we come to have as well. Um, and that is to say that if one sees students, even young students, 17, 18 year old, uh, late adolescent, undergraduate students, as proto scholars, as people who are joining a dialogue, and not only joining a dialogue, but joining a a process by which they are expected to acquire the skills of a scholar just as the faculty will practice the skills of a scholar, uh, then uh, over time, especially over the generations, one begins to, to, to nurture a certain kind of student culture, and a student, student, not only a, the way in which faculty relate to students and students relate to faculty, but the way students relate to each other. And leaving aside the uh, issue of formal legal rights or formal rules, um, one finds emerging within Chicago a culture of very intensive and interactive pedagogy. This has dominated um, the practice of our classrooms in the college, certainly, and I think elsewhere in the graduate and professional schools as well. Um, and, and this is not something to be taken for granted. It was not s typical uh, because our student culture was not typical. Um, and further, uh, I think it's important to remember that this culture was also um, uh, not only um, going to in a sense infused by these ideals of academic freedom, but it was also infused by parallel ideas of merit and a lack of um, ascriptive privilege or inherited wealth because of a variety of complex reasons that I don't want to go into here but it are, are discussed in my book. Um, the early student body of Chicago was rather different from many of the Eastern universities. It was, a, first of all, it was, it was male and female. It was, uh, 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 both genders were represented in very strong numbers. But also there was a rather broad socioeconomic spectrum of student, uh, 
students from, from really all walks of life and all socioeconomic classes. And the merger of this highly pluralistic student body, for the time very highlistic, uh, in, in, including a very large component of, of Jewish students, uh, both from Chicago and from the East, um, g gave the, um, the faculty a, a, an even greater reason and a greater opportunity to practice this kind of diversity of opinion and the, 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 practice these ideals of academic freedom. Um, with such talented students as partners, the faculty created an extraordinary learning community, stressing both the intrinsic power of the liberal arts, uh, but also the, uh, the need to serve a broad uh, swath of, 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 uh, of students from, from really all walks of life. And they saw this teaching of, the, of these students as being integral to their mission as a university. It's, I, I think it's very important to remember that undergraduate education, which is in some ways always the kind of the, 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 the hardest test of whether the one's values of you know, about, about the importance of teaching are really have any currency or any, or any there's a reality principle there at all. Teaching of undergraduates in Chicago has always been seen to be a um, not not a, an occasional or trivial service, but also a really one that has goes to the heart of the broader milieu of scholarly practice, scholarly values that inform the the identity of the faculty. And so one has uh, a, a, a faculty culture that is very early set and kind of gels around these ideas of academic freedom and then, and then brings the student culture into that culture of, of, of academic freedom. And the student culture that comes into it is itself relatively, for the time, diverse in terms of socioeconomic and gender perspectives. And the, the result is that um, uh, we have a, um, I think much of the broader and more fundamental identity of the University of Chicago is owing to our practices of academic freedom. And those practices have created a kind of resilient intellectual culture, but also a culture of intellectual resilience among both the faculty and the students that has uh, been quite, um, it's really there already by 1920 and 1930, and it's really quite remarkable how it's been able to sustain itself over the generations to create and recreate itself really down to the very present day. Thank you. I want to talk a bit about the free expression part of academic freedom. And it's important to know that these are not necessarily completely overlapping. There are aspects of academic freedom that are different from the concept of free expression in a university. Um, and I want to start by emphasizing that the assurance of free expression in university communities is not something to be taken for granted, that it is, in fact, vulnerable that it is tenuous, and that it has always been so. And that any threat to the commitment to free expression poses a serious risk to the core functioning of universities as we now have come to understand them. So to appreciate that, I think it's important to go back in time a bit and understand how colleges and universities over time have evolved in this respect. So if you go back to the early years of the 19th century, for example, there was no such thing as an assumption of freedom of expression in colleges in the United States. Uh, the basic assumption of how those institutions operated was under a principle of doctrinal moralism, which basically meant that ideas could be put forth by faculty or by students only insofar as they were consistent with the judgments of the leaders of the institution about what ideas were moral and appropriate. And anyone who departed from those clear assumptions could be suspended, expelled, fired, whatever, without anybody looking twice. And so what did that mean? It meant that in many colleges in the United States, um, you, one could not challenge the proposition that um, Africans were uh, inherently inferior, that women's place was in the home, and their function was simply to reproduce children, um, that homosexuality was immoral and sodomistic and sinful, um, and a host of other values and judgments that were taken largely for granted as a given. And it's true. And anyone who challenged those ideas would not just be argued with, they'd be thrown out. And if you move a little bit further in time into the 1830s and 1840s, as the United States moved towards civil war, one of the most contentious, contentious issues in the nation, of course, was slavery. Um, and in that period, lines were drawn very clearly. At universities and colleges in the North, anyone who defended slavery could find themselves, again, uh, thrown out of the institution. And in the South, 
at major colleges uh, anyone who uh, challenged the moral legitimacy of slavery uh, would find themselves uh, on their ear and out of the institutions. And nobody questioned this. This was the authority of the college to make judgments about what was right and what was wrong. And if you did not speak in accord with those judgments, you were out. Think of General Motors, right? General Motors can decide among its employees what it, views that they express are okay or not okay. And if somebody says things that General Motors says we don't want to hear in our institution, they'd be fired. And nobody would say academic freedom. They'd just be fired. That's the way colleges and universities operated. Um, this came to a head um, after the Civil War, during the battle over creationism and Darwinism, um, when the, the mainstream views in universities was committed to um, creationism. And the idea of evolution was seen as uh, not only uh, sacrilegious, but scientifically and logically completely flawed and inappropriate. And there were institutions that excoriated and fired and expelled students who advocated this revolutionary and r radical and ridiculous idea of evolution in institutions that were committed to creationism. Well, it was in that battle that for the first time, the idea of free expression as a value of universities and academic freedom as a value of universities began to crystallize. The idea being that institutions of higher learning have to be places where people can challenge the accepted wisdom, where the accepted wisdom may not be right. It may not be true that Africans are inherently inferior and women's places in the home and that homosexuality is inherently immoral and that creationism is absolutely true. And the idea that universities existed for the purpose of allowing intellectual inquiry and challenge and contestation came over those years to be much more accepted. And indeed, by 1892, when the University of Chicago was created, uh, the first president of the university, William Rainey Harper, could proclaim that for university to be a university, it has to be committed to the idea of free expression. Now, that was the beginning of the notion that free expression was central. But the reality is any commitment to that has been contested and contingent ever since. So even at the time that Harper was saying this, uh, universities began to be supported by generous philanthropists who had earned their money as industrialists. And they basically said that any of your faculty or students who criticize the way in which we make our money, the way in which we conduct our businesses, well, that's not acceptable. If you want our money, shut them up. They can't say those things. And universities found themselves in this dilemma where they wanted the philanthropy but the condition of the philanthropy was to get rid of free expression by their faculty and by their students. Um, during World War I, again, uh, universities and colleges found themselves in a dilemma where the nation took the position that no one can criticize the legality or the morality or the wisdom of the United States entering the war because that would undermine patriotism. It would make it more difficult to fight the war successfully. It would strengthen the will of the enemy. Any of that had to be silenced. And universities, again, found themselves collapsing in the face of these social and legal demands. Um, again, during the era of McCarthyism in the 1940s and 1950s, universities found themselves faced with enormous pressure to basically silence and expel and fire anyone who had taken positions at any time in their lives that was sympathetic to communism. And the, fight, the pushback was about academic freedom and about freedom of expression. And the University of Chicago, I'm proud to say, really stood pretty much alone in standing up against that. Um, at one point, students at the University of Chicago invited uh, William Foster, who was the head of the Communist Party of the United States, to speak on campus. And this produced an outrage across the nation. And uh, alumni and state legislators uh, demanded that this be canceled. And uh, Robert Maynard Hutchins, who John mentioned earlier, stood up and said, no, at this university, our students are allowed to hear whatever ideas they want to hear. And we will not censor that, and we will not silence them. And that characterized, the, the, epitomized the notion of free expression in a university community. But this has continued to be under assault, and as always will be under assault, because there will always be people who say, I don't like those ideas. Those ideas are wrong. They're immoral. They're offensive. And they may be right. Sometimes they're right. Sometimes they're wrong. But what makes a university a university is that it does not accede to those demands for censorship. 
that what it says instead is fight it out, argue about it, talk about it, learn about it, think about it. And by doing so, it creates students and citizens who are capable of having those fights in the future, who are capable of dealing with ideas they do not like, they find offensive, they find problematic, and to fight it out and to win those battles. And that's a core of what this institution is about. It's a core of what academic freedom is about. It's a core of what freedom of expression at the university is about. And it is imperative that we resist the temptation to do what our forebears did and to silence everyone who thinks differently than we do. That is not the way to achieve knowledge. It's not the way to achieve a democracy. And it's not the way to have an intellectual or academic institution. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. I like a podium. Um, sorry. I've, I've developed a habit, I guess. Um, I actually had some slides, and I didn't didn't quite work out to get them up for you, but I'm going to read off them, so that's actually why I need a little bit of space. Um, and one of them was uh, a picture of the letter uh, that went out to the um, incoming students from um, the dean um, that had this sentence. Uh, um, Our commitment to academic freedom at the University of Chicago means that we do not support so-called quote-unquote trigger warnings, we do not cancel invited speakers because their topics might prove controversial, and we do not condone the, creating, the creation of intellectual, quote unquote, safe spaces where individuals can retreat from ideas and perspectives at odds with their own. What I'm about to say is not a trigger warning. It is a spoiler, a spoiler alert, okay? We'll talk about the difference between spoiler alerts, trigger warnings, and content um, uh, warnings or notes, content notes. Um, so the title of my remarks today is Who's Free Speech? The Manufactured Crisis Over Trigger Warnings and Safe Spaces. That's the spoiler alert. Um, <clears throat> this is not the, the idea that this is in part a manufactured crisis. Uh, this is not simply my opinion uh, that much of the anxiety about campus cultures and free speech on campuses is in fact, in fact a manufactured crisis. Uh, I think it's important to, to think about it, and I'm happy that we're doing that today, uh, because I think it, in fact, alerts us to a number of things happening in our political culture. And um, like my esteemed colleagues, I'll put that in a little bit of a historical context, although I won't go very, um, very far back. I'll just go to the 90s, when there was also a lot of media hysteria about campuses and multiculturalism's evil twin, political correctness, and uh, diversity, and what that was doing to uh, the intellectual culture of campuses. So we'll talk about all of those things. <clears throat> um, um, so I want to just read first from the uh, report that came out from Penn, which is, of course, an organization devoted uh, to free speech. Uh, so the report is called And Campus for All, Diversity, Inclusion, and Freedom of Speech at U.S. Universities, and they go through a number of cases of these campus controversies, Yale University, my home university being one of them. My One of my students is, a, is the cover girl, if you look at the report. But I just want to um, read from the summaries, uh, uh, some of their sum sum the summary statements. Okay. <clears throat> says, quote, while free speech is alive and well on campus, it is not free from threats and must be vigilantly guarded if its continued strength is to be assured. I think that's something that we can probably all agree on. Uh, the second point, while current campus controversies merit attention and there have been some troubling instances of speech, speech curtailed, these do not represent a pervasive crisis, in quotes, for, speech, for free speech on campus. Um, the next point, the dialogues, debates, and efforts at greater inclusion take place on many camp taking place on many campuses have the potential to help root out entrenched biases that have impeded the participation of members of marginalized groups. Uh, the next point, these conversations and, con and controversies have, been, have the potential to unleash and amplify new and important voices that can enrich debates on campus and in wider society, thereby expanding free speech for everyone's benefit. Next point, at times protests and forms of expression are treated as if they are incursions on free speech when in fact they are manifestations of free speech. 
And finally, uh, free, free expression should be recognized as a principle that will overwhelmingly serve not to exclude or marginalize minority voices, but rather to amplify them. Okay, um, so that's the Penn report, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a bit. But I just want to say that, like my colleagues, I, of course, believe uh, that you know the edge of learning should be an uncomfortable place. I have never put a trigger warning on any of my syllabi. Um, because frankly, the syllabus, I guess, is the trigger warning. Well, actually, it's not. We have a, we have a real misconception about what a trigger warning is, right? The idea is that a trigger warning uh, is going to tell you if you're going to be triggered, that you're going to be traumatized by the content. Uh, so the presumption is that whoever's reading it suffers from PTSD. I don't presume that all of my students suffer from PTSD. Uh, <clears throat> that's different from a content warning. Content warning is letting someone know this content, uh, you might not realize it, but this might trouble you in ways. This might, like a book on lynching, you know that's going to be a book about lynching. But when you look at my syllabus, you can pr pretty much figure out what my class is going to be about. However, uh, later, this, let me just give you an example from this semester. We had a, we had a suicide on our campus of one of the tracks, uh, athletes on the track team killed himself. That day, I was going to uh, show a film called Hell House in my documentary film class. In that film, it's about evangelical Christians, and they um, have, sort of have this sort of, uh, they put on these uh, morality plays where they talk, you know, they do a number of things, um, make a number of kind of controversial statements, the things that I thought would, might upset my students, including do uh, an act of suicide where the suicide, the, the person who commits suicide then goes to hell and is sort of taunted by the devil. So I sent an email to my students saying, just so you know, we're going to watch this film this afternoon uh, because two of the students were actually on the same track team as this person who just committed suicide. I also said, I understand if you don't want to watch this today, but I also hope that our seminar is a place where we can actually talk about people's misconceptions about suicide and mental health. And, that this, and actually, they all came. We all talked about it. So does, is that a trigger warning? I don't know. Maybe I, I guess that's the closest thing I've ever done to indulging in a trigger warning. But um, the question of, you know, trigger warnings as this like pervasive exercise that, that uh, professors are engaging in is actually an empirical question. I actually went through, because of the hysteria about Yale, I actually went through, because Yale syllabi are actually public, I actually went through and looked for any syllabi at Yale that have a trigger warning on them. I couldn't find one. So my question when I read about you know, the statement, that, the, the letter that went out to students at the University of Chicago is I wonder how many syllabi at the University of Chicago have a trigger warning on them that elicited this letter, this, was, this letter is responding to. Is this, is this in fact a problem that so many syllabi have these warnings for these students? So who, are the, who, who, who is this sort of imagined student body right, that's being warned? Um, uh, so I guess um, I think that you know this, this is what I, what I want us to think about. I guess is you know what what's really going on here? Who are these students? I'm, then I of course thought of uh, <clears throat> feminist scholar Sarah Ahmed's uh, essay, which is a wonderful essay called "Against Students," where she cautions us to pay attention to the broad sweeping statements made against students who seem quote unquote oversensitive. Um, I, and I agree wholeheartedly with the way she translates that as oversensitive being sensitive to that which is not over. In other words these students, and usually students of color that are being demonized, are actually building on generations of student activism um, to change our universities to actually make them more inclusive. She says that students have become a problem because they are too sensitive. Students, uh, the, the, the idea that students have become a problem because they are too sensitive relates to a wider public discourse that describes offendability as a form of moral weakness and a, as a restriction on our freedom of speech. Much contemporary racism works by positioning the others as too easily offendable, which is how some come to assert their right to occupy space by being offensive. And of course, when we think about the right to offend crowd, who are those guys? Usually they're guys. Um, who are those people, right? Um, you know, I don't know how many of you caught this in the news, but you know, the, if there's a poster boy for that movement right now, it's Milo, and he just got a $250,000 book deal. I think he's going to get a chance to get his say. Um, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to get it's pretty hard to get banned from Twitter. That doesn't explain it. I don't know what. Does. I mean, 
the point being that um, this popular misconception of college students undergirds discussions of academic freedom, college students of color in particular, as I said, that they're super fragile, oversensitive, entitled, that they can't handle intense exchange of ideas, um, oh, that, they, they, that everything's a personal slight, I'm running out of time, uh, politically correct, coddled millennials, cry bullies, they just need to grow up. <coughs> I'll say that I think much of what happened at Yale, I mean, luckily we're gonna have a chance to kind of expand into other things in the Q&A as we go into the other questions. I'll just say this. I think that part of what happened with the controversy at Yale is that people saw that tiny viral, um, the, the, the garish viral version of this debate that happened on my campus is that <coughs> the whole, the, the, there's two sides, right? There's the good intellectual side, which believes in free speech and, then the, and, and nurtures sort of resilience. And then there's the bad identity politics side um, of quasi intellectuals who want their you know, hurt feelings indulged and um, campus scrubbed of anything that might hurt their feelings. Um, and I think that that image of a young black woman, you know, which is a tiny slice of you know, just a, which is not representative of, of the much more complex series of events and debates that happen on our campus, but that tiny viral image of a couple seconds of a, of a young black girl who lost her temper in front of her calm white professor, the reason it went viral, the reason it caught, caught fire and caught the imagination of the American public is because it fuses two pre-existing stereotypes together of the coddled millennial and the angry black woman. And, that, and that's why everybody thinks that they already know what's happening at Yale. They already know what's happening in all of our classrooms. They already know what's on our syllabi without even having, having to look. <clears throat> um, so I think what we need to think about is, is the you know, instructive and often predictable patterns in who feels they shouldn't have to discuss certain topics, just as there are patterns in the types of folks that hold systems ac uh, accountable to, respect, to, to respectful practices. We have to make time and sometimes challenge ourselves to attend to those patterns. We also have to think about the right to offend crowd and who, who, the, who those people are. But there's also other questions we might ask. Well, something that came from the, pre, in the, in the preliminary remarks was that to say that diversity is not somehow in conflict with academic freedom might be disingenuous. Well, would we say that about capitalism? Uh, we're at a moment right now where tenure is more in crisis than it's ever been before. Doesn't that compromise uh, academic freedom? when uh, professors feel like their jobs are in jeopardy. I mean, there's other ways of framing the, the, the academic freedom on campuses other than we have students of color now, what do we do? Um, so that's really what I want us to think about, is that how are we actually framing this whole debate about free speech? Is this even about free speech? Uh, and, and, and is, or or is, this a, is this a diversion? Um, and so you know, I'm, I'm, I, 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 I am fully committed to making campuses more diverse. I'm also fully committed to academic freedom. Um, and, I, and I want us to try to move, move the conversation in, in a direction where we can kind of make some of these um, you know, think, think about these things together, but also think about why are we making, why are we talking about certain things together, but not other things together? Thank you. Um, is this on, or what am I supposed to do? Yeah. Is there a thing here? Is this on? Okay, it's on. I hear my voice. Uh, so I want to thank the the speakers who preceded me, I think they actually, um, in all three of the presentations, or perhaps four or five, um, were able to lay out a lot of the issues that we're here to discuss. And I'm just I'm going to start off by saying a little bit about my own standpoint, who I am, and then really talk about the focus of my remarks, which are around the role of professional education and professional schools in the academy and how that complicates our discussion of diversity and academic freedom. So as is the case with our other speakers on this panel, my perspective is unique. It reflects who I am. My standpoint is that of a woman of color, a Latina, a baby boomer, and somebody who has attended and worked at highly selective universities. Um, I'm a direct beneficiary of the affirmative action programs of the last 20th centuries in all three institutions that I was um, very fortunate to attend, Stanford University, the University of Chicago School of Social Service Administration, and the University of Michigan. Um, in addition to those standpoints, I've also taught for over 25 years in graduate social work programs, in addition to the teaching I do 
in the liberal arts. And in that case, I teach in the Department of Psychology and in the Latino Studies program at the University of Michigan. So I have the experience of teaching both in the liberal arts as well as in a professional school. Um, I also chose to leave my, leave my full-time career as a social worker to return to school and get a PhD because of a gap I saw in social work education and in social work practice at that time regarding our need to prepare professionals to work more effectively with women and communities of color. Um, as, a, as a graduate of SSA, I can say there was very little attention to that in 1976 to 78 when I um, sat in the lobby and drank my coffee um, during the breaks and attended seminars here. And I know things have changed. Things have changed in social work um, education in general, but we could all be doing a lot more um, in terms of that agenda. And that is the agenda that, I, that motivated me to go back to school, get a PhD, enter social work education as a career, and has also motivated much of my scholarship as well because I wanted to be part of the solution rather than part of the problem in our field and in our society. So I think our previous panelists have done a really excellent job describing the meanings of academic freedom and its significance in our field of higher education and scholarship. We all in academia need the right to choose the questions we want to ask and the ways in which we are going to explore them without a heavy hand of our institutions dictating that. When I was at, earlier in my career at the University of Michigan, I had the privilege to work with Nancy Cantor, who is a psychologist and is currently the chancellor at Rutgers um, Newark campus. At that time, she was the provost at the University of Michigan. In her inaugural address, she described contemporary universities as analogous to cities, which have an array of neighborhoods and communities within them. And she described how students can see this environment, and these are her wor words, as exciting, confusing, challenging, sometimes frustrating, and often complex. And that these communities can, for students, be experienced as replete with challenges, opportunities, rules and regulations, and policies and procedures that they may not fully understand or fully recognize, even in their experience. And as an educator and scholar, I find this to be a useful framework to really try to think about how it is that students experience the university environment. This description of the university as a city relates both to their experiences within courses, within our seminars and courses we teach, and our tutorials, but it's also relevant to their experiences outside of courses in their co-curricular experiences surrounding their, their um, time as students at universities. One could argue that academic freedom is most relevant to that aspect of the university that students experience in their formal education, in their courses, in their tutorials, and in the projects that they do for credit. And it may be seen as less significant when we think about the co-curricular, when we think about the activities and events that occur outside of courses, but have a significant, but are a significant part of what educational scholars refer to as the university experience or the hidden or implicit curriculum, those things that we experience and learn in institutions of higher education that are not part of the formal curriculum, that are not in our course outlines or described, but are part of the lived experiences of how students experience um, their time in the university. So why should we care about diversity? Diversity in our society and world, in our world play a huge role in what's going on in the academy currently. And diversity is a huge part of both the hidden and the formal curricula that students experience. When I look back at my undergraduate years um, at Stanford University during the 1970s, the majority of the faculty and the students I interacted with were, were white, were upper middle class to upper class, and they were very comfortable in an environment which embodied upper middle class norms and expectations and um, a Euro European American type of culture. The expectation at that time was that I, as a lower middle class, third generation Mexican American student, uh, there on affirmative action scholarships, would learn to conform. And if I did not conform, that I would struggle and that it was no one's responsibility but my own 
to figure out how to deal with that struggle. It was not, and it is still not, easy to be a woman of color in a highly selective university, whether as student, staff, member of the faculty, or named professor, as I am at the University of Michigan. Because most university and faculty and staff still expect conformity from all of our students. This is part of the hidden curriculum. But our institutions and the society around it are, gro are growing in many different types of diversity in terms of who's now attending universities, who's working in the universities, and who's creating the knowledge that we're developing in universities. And so our, this diversity will continue to grow in our society and in our world, and our universities must also grow and change as well as our students live in and will continue to live in a very different reality from the one that I grew up in, the one that my children, who are now adults, grew up in, and the, and the one in which we are living currently. So we need our uh, curricula, and we need to be attentive to how our curricula and how, those, and how they support or stifle the voices within them, including the voices of those who have traditionally been outsiders to the academy. As somebody who teaches both in the liberal arts and a professional school, I can say that the tensions and dynamics that can exist between academic freedom and diversity take a different form when working and teaching in a professional school. Professional schools are interdisciplinary spaces within colleges and universities where faculty and students come together bound by a mission to prepare students to learn the skills, methods, and values and ethics to practice particular fields that will benefit our society. In professional schools, we do build upon a liberal arts base, and we engage in the kind of work that other faculty members in terms of knowledge development and teaching. But we also have a role to prepare students to work toward a particular professional mission. It is the case in all, this is the case in all professional schools, whether we're talking about law, medicine, education, or social work. And therefore, faculty in professional schools must focus on how well our students are being prepared to work in an increasingly diverse world. So I'm going to now give the example of social work as a professional school, because that's obviously the one with which I am most familiar. But I think we can think of parallels with other professional forms of education as well. In respect to diversity, the mission of social work and the mission of social work education must be woven into both our formal and informal curricula, so both the explicit and the implicit curricula. The National Association of Social Workers, which is the membership organization for social workers in the United States, describes social workers' work in the following ways, as promoting social justice and social change with and on behalf of clients. And when they speak of clients, they are inclusive of individuals, families, groups, organizations, and communities. In order to do this work, the NASW describes, says that social workers must be sensitive to cultural and ethnic diversity and strive to end discrimination, oppression, poverty, and other forms of social injustice. This mission is woven into our code of ethics, which includes a principle that states that social workers challenge social injustice and that social workers should act to prevent and eliminate, eliminate domination of exploitation of and discrimination against any person, group, or class on the basis of race, ethnicity, national origin, color, sex, sexual orientation, gender identity or expression, age, marital status, political belief, religion, immigration status, or mental or physical disability. So when those of us who are engaged in this profession who have chosen to become a social worker or chosen to teach social work education or to work as a faculty member of a social work in a social work school need to have awareness of the mission of the profession and the profession that we are preparing students to engage in. In the United States, the Council on Social Work Education accredits schools um, that offer the professional social work degrees, which are defined as a BSW and MSW or the equivalent MA or MS as is offered at the, at the, oops, I've killed my mic, okay. Um, 
Where do these ethics and, and, and accreditation standards come from? They come from the members. I have the privilege of actually being on the committee with Jean Marsh, who is a former dean here, and faculty member um, in creating the educational policy in the early 2000s. And so our standards for accreditation also um, reflect our social work values and ethics. Our accreditation policy in the United States parallels and is similar to the other policies that exist in schools of social work around the globe. In fact, other schools in other countries are much more explicit about our social justice mission and need to work for social change. I'm going to say a little bit then about some of the backlash that this has received. Um, this focus has not been without controversy. Although the research that has been done on social work faculty, including research that I have done with national surveys of social work faculty, have found that we, for the most part, approve of this mission and endorse this focus of our educational programs. But we have received um, and been the target of attacks from those outside of our profession, particularly the National Association of Scholars which describes itself as a network of scholars and citizens united for a, to a commitment to academic freedom, disinterested scholarship, and excellence in higher education. They engaged on a report called The Scandal of Social Work Education, which accused social work programs as um, working to brainwash students to exclude those who did not um, share the political beliefs of the social work field, and to, in fact, um, in many ways, torment and marginalized people who did not um, share, who were not working for social justice as defined in a particular way. They also, at that time, this was almost 10 years ago, um, filed a complaint with the Secretary of the Department of Health and Human Services asking that schools of social work um, no longer be required to be accredited by the Council on Social Work Education because of their objection to our accreditation standards. Um, the, the NAS was not successful in bringing down social work education. HHS found no basis for their complaint, which stated that we were violating students' First Amendment rights. And as expected, of course, our national organizations responded by providing a context for our ed ethical and educational standards and framed our use of the concept of social justice. For example, some rather conservative um, institutions of higher learning, such as Baylor and Brigham Young, have accredited social work programs. So clearly there's a range in which schools of social work are interpreting and offering courses that meet the accreditation standards. I only suspect that these kinds of attacks and critiques directed toward, univers toward universities and social work programs and perhaps other professional um, programs which have similar kinds of values will only be become more common in the near and perhaps distant future. Uh, I just want to say one more thing regarding the need, the, what social work schools and social work programs can offer higher education in terms of teaching this kind of content and addressing what may be seen as a conflict between diversity and um, academic freedom. We've been doing this kind of work for decades, for quite a long time. We, have, we struggle with it. We haven't arrived. We may never arrive. This is an ongoing, lifelong activity, um, but we do have skills, we have programs, we have evidence-based educational practices, and we have a lot of experience of, for thinking of ways to create what we call brave spaces in contrast to sp safe spaces in our classrooms, to develop ways to call people in who may be expressing um, different views rather than calling them out and shaming them in the classroom to recognize what Larry Shulman refers to as the hidden group in the classroom and the group dynamics that can create very difficult and challenging discussions. And also the differing needs for faculty support and training that can exist within a faculty so that all of us can be helpful in terms of meeting both the goals of um, diversity and academic freedom. Thank you. So now, um, in the interest of time, I'm going to just transition right into our question. And I think we have slide. OK. Oh. So this is an abbreviated version of what I'm going to read to all of you um, as the first question. So 
Uh, academic freedom extends to students, as many articulated in their comments, and to its practice in the classroom. Last summer, following a student-led petition, SSA's Task Force for Radical Transformation, a staff, student, and faculty-led committee, specifically called for instructors to advance their abilities to facilitate robust and critical discussions of topics such as social justice, oppression, disenfranchisement, white privilege, and a host of other concepts and ideas that bring emotionally charged conversations into the classroom. Reflective of the very hallmark of the University of Chicago's brand of free exchange and ideas, students are calling not only for free exchange, but deep dives into open and authentic dialogue that help to foster their own abilities to engage out in the world as effective social workers and agents of change. They are often looking to their professors to model this critical engagement. Students across the United States have also called for similar improvements in their educational training and classroom experience. How should universities balance a student's desire, and in the case of SSA and elsewhere, their demand for this educational experience against the right of a faculty to teach to their own expertise? And then, of course, I have to have sub-questions. So. Uh. Also, which is why it's here and in your seats. What actions can or should institutions take, if any, to ensure members of the community have the capacity to facilitate and meaningfully engage in sometimes highly contentious and deeply personal dialogue on issues that are tied to diversity, inequality, and privilege, subject matters that are typically not the substantive or theoretical areas of expertise for most faculty? And any four of you can have at it. <laughs> this was not on our sheet, by the way. Yeah, that's the first, it's the first one. Oh, not the whole thing. Okay, <laughs> that's the last part of the question. Well, you know, I guess you know I've, I've heard versions of this question posed. Um, I find it puzzling to think that there are faculty in schools of social work who have not thought about these things. Some people may have thought about them, they aren't sure quite how to articulate them. Some people have thought about them and they're not sure how to teach them. Some people have thought about them and maybe they're just not very good, effective facilitators of difficult discussions because many of us are not. So there are a lot of reasons why someone may not engage in these discussions in their classrooms, but I, I would suspect that when you think of a bell curve, the people, most of the people in the bell curve um, of a faculty in the School of Social Work would have considered these things, are doing research related to issues such as health disparities, um, educational, um, lack of problems with educational opportunity, workplace stress issues, all, all of which are things that relate to this. And I think then the question is how can faculty perhaps develop more of the skills and the perspectives for feeling comfortable <coughs> engaging in difficult discussions with others. And so I think it's often less a question of what people know and care about and what they are passionate about and more a question about how can we offer faculty supportive growth experiences and environments to be able to think about how to maybe address some of the concerns that students are bringing to the class. So I think, you know, when I think about the faculty in my own school, there's a range of people who are very good at leading these discussions, but I can't think of one person who doesn't care about issues around diversity, equity, or inclusion. I mean, I think faculty members have a high degree of academic freedom in deciding how to approach the education process. Um, I think there are limits to that, obviously. Um, you can't decide to teach a course and not have it meet unless there's a good reason educationally for that. Um, and uh, there are boundaries on what, is, what, what courses you teach and, and so on. But I think for the most part, there's a strong presumption in favor of faculty freedom to decide how best to deal with students and how to deal with best with particular subjects. At the same time, I think it's the responsibility of the institution to ensure that faculty are doing their jobs well and are teaching effectively and to offer guidance and help to encourage that. Um, uh, but I think to insist upon these things to individual faculty members is very difficult. 
And it doesn't mean it's impossible. If someone's really being a lousy teacher in some meaningful and objective way, then an institution has an obligation to intervene. But I would think the right way of dealing with this is by encouragement and persuasion and by explaining to faculty, you'll be better at your job if you do these things, whatever these things happen to be. You know, I think one of the uh, uh, things that's come up for us at Yale is that we've really been having this conversation about like, the foundational val oh, sorry, the foundational values of a liberal arts education. Is that working? Can you hear me now? No. Oh. Oh, did I turn it off? Uh, the other thing. Yeah. Yeah. And free speech is being suppressed. Okay. <laughs> mm -hmm. I think it seems to be okay. okay. Um, I think that you know one of the things that's come up for us on our campus is this: just the idea that uh, a liberal arts education has to be an anti-racist education. That's a foundational value, and so that would permeate, you know, across um, disciplines. Uh, you know, uh, I think one of the things that you said is, well, what, what can the institution actually do? I think we need to think critically about the ways in which we organize knowledge and um, the ways in which we assign prestige and resources to certain things, faculty lines. Uh, um, I, I wrote an, uh, an op-ed in the Washington Post after the crisis at Yale basically saying this is not about free speech. My student, you know, um, anti-racist activists at Yale, student activists at Yale are not, are not understand that this is not a conflict, conflict, conflict with free speech. Um, and I got a lot of hate mail. And one of the things someone wrote me was said, look at your bio. You Studies in an ethnicity, race, and migration. That's like a politically correct joke. You know, I remember when faculty at Yale had degrees in things like anthropology and history. Now, um, the funny thing is my PhD is in anthropology and history. Um, <laughs> you know, so it's just like, I think part of it is that, you know, it's just this, this notion that um, the kinds of work we, we do is like not serious, not really intellectual, not really rigorous if we talk about racial inequality or sexism or homophobia. Um, and so this actually goes back to what I wanted, I didn't get to say in my remarks, but you know, uh, in, in 1991, there was this really interesting article written by um, a conservative a thinker, what's his name, what's it? oh God, who was it? I don't remember now, but he basically makes his argument, um, Will, it was uh, George Will, uh, wrote in Newsweek that Lynn Cheney has just an important has has as equally important of a job as her husband Dick Cheney. She's a Secretary of Domestic Defense. Is a quote: "The foreign adversaries her husband Dick must keep at bay are less dangerous in the long run than the domestic forces which she must deal at the NEA and NEH." And um, basically, he goes on to you know talk about scholars and student radicals and these other people that were imposing group politics and um, on uh, curricular issues on campuses. And so in the '90s. That was it was really conceived of as this problem around curriculum, and now it's this issue of trigger warnings and safe spaces. And I mean, so I think that this it doesn't. It, in some ways, the conversation has not really changed that much. Um, it's sort of like, well, are we allowed to teach what we want to teach? Yes, we're allowed to teach what we want to teach, but we also have to address these other larger issues. In other words, if students are asking us to, to address a wider set of concerns and questions. How is that in opposition to free speech? That should actually that should actually be expanding our conversation. Shouldn't we, we shouldn't be feel constrained by that. That's actually, I think, an exciting direction that we're moving in. Um, I, uh, Jeff and I both lived through the um, uh, trying to reform our curriculum. Uh, this is uh, I think it was Woodrow Wilson who said it's easier to move a graveyard than to reform a curriculum, and, and, and he, he was right. Uh, and uh, Never do it again. Um, I, I think the, um, I've always thought that, uh, I'm not familiar with the specific issues that are preoccupying the community in SSA, but it's, it seems to me that if, if one is dealing with a, um, a subject like racism or nationalism or, or ethnic uh, 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 discrimination or, or uh, the Holocaust or, or whatever, I mean, these large and big issues that kind of are, are spread across the 19th and 20th centuries, um, and that a, a scholar who is um, competent, hopefully more than competent, uh, should be able to take out of the diversity of scholarly views, because in all of these issues you're going to have a number of different powerful di diversions of uh, views in, in the scholarly realm, and fashion a curriculum or a syllabus or a, a, a way of conducting the class uh, in which the, uh, a couple of things happen. First of all, students are become aware of the di diversity of opinions about these controversial issues, but also 
learn how to manage and uh, the formulation, not manage them, but how to come to their own view. I mean, when it doesn't want to spoon feed people, whatever, you know, wherever one is coming from, one wants the students to have their own viewpoints and their own intellectual personalities. And that has to come as much from the students, it seems to me, as from us as the teachers. So how does one use the construction of a syllabus and the, the, kind of the ways in which one can present different viewpoints and encourage the debate to get the, um, the students to, to, to take ownership and, 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 and come to a, a view that's their own view, not, not my view or his view or her view or her view. And, and it seems to me every, every scholar ought to be able to do that. I mean, that's really part of what we do as, 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 as a... Um, it's part of the job description of being a professor, it seems to me. And what so, if they can't? Well, uh, you know, that, that, then one has to, I think, go back to what are we doing in graduate schools now in terms of uh, how are we preparing people to be scholars? Um, uh, and that's a whole, we ought to have a whole it's another panel. panel. We, we are um, having another panel. Um, uh, and and <laughs> how, how are we mentoring or nurturing? You know, you can pick your, your word about it. Uh, young, young faculty, uh, it, it's... You know, we, we, we have a core curriculum like Columbia, and we regularly ask young people, young, young they, they seem young to me, young faculty, to, um, to uh, you know, I, I still remember the, the day I, I, I we were hiring a uh, psychologist, a clinical psychologist, and part of our curriculum, we, we teach Freud, and asking this person to teach Freud, well, you know, no, nobody reads Freud anymore, like, uh, the, you know, that, that, like that's, excuse me, well, I kind of like, we're supposed to teach Freud. Uh, I, I can teach Freud, you can teach Freud. Um, and um, and the look on the, the so that the, it seems to me the, the there's there's a process of of, of uh, I don't want to use the word training but mentoring and so forth but ultimately Jeff is right ultimately you know they're there they're their own person and and once they get tenure Lord help us because they're they're, gonna, they're <laughs> that's also a subject for another debate. That is another, that is another well, right. can, I, can I just say something about that? First of all, I, I teach Freud um, and I'm. Not so old, but I would also say that you know the the, the the notion that like well no one's teaching any of the classics anymore. I mean this was the idea in the 90s, and a woman, a young woman from Harvard, wrote an essay that was published that went wasn't there was before the age of virality, but it was a pop, became a popular essay. She said, "I went to four years of Harvard and never read a book by a single black author or black woman author." But there was this idea that at Harvard nobody's reading Shakespeare and everybody's reading Audre Lorde now. It's all black lesbians 24/7, um, you know, and. and and that was the idea, but which was so far from the truth. And this is exactly what people think now. I mean, and I think this notion of like, how do we balance the canon that we are inheriting with the new stuff the kids are asking for? Well, God, hasn't that always been the question? I mean, that's sort of like moving through time. We always have to adjust our syllabi. Um, you know, I don't know. I think that the, the, the anxi specific anxieties around uh, this being like a... Um, to, to satisfy the student demand um, because they're students of color, as opposed to, you know, a lot, you know what my problem is? It's not about um, f not teaching Freud. My problem is just getting them to buy a course pack because they want to read everything on a screen even though they don't have very good memory retention when they read from screens. And this is, this is my issue. I, I, I don't know, I can convince them to read Freud. I just can't convince them to buy paper. Um, <laughs> Right, so I think that you know, framing everything in terms of the curricular problems being around a, a, a racial diversity or a new demographic of students is, is actually, I think, m missing the point. I think that the, what I'm complaining about is actually a, probably a much more pervasive anxiety that professors have across campuses. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, I will squeeze in one last question. I think we have maybe a moment for that. So as an alum of 1967, who was referenced in this year's Aims of Education talk by Professor Stone, emphasized that the university has a responsibility to create communities, uh, a, a responsibility to create a community of people as well as a community of ideas in which everyone feels a sense of belonging. What are the contemporary challenges, responsibilities, and opportunities for universities as institutions to create a sense of community and belonging that engages all of its members, and what is the role of academic freedom in fostering this? And then my sub-questions. <laughs> How might the prevailing practice of institutional neutrality on political and social issues as an important context for academic freedom, but practiced as silence, contribute to a campus climate and sense of belonging for different members differently within our community? 
So can I just take a stab at this? I think there's two, two things I would say to this question. The first is this idea of the safe space, which I think is completely mis misunderstood. How I understand it is simply that the classroom needs to be a civil space. So, for example, you know, I, I, I teach a lot about um, Islam and U.S. Middle East relations. So, I actually get students from a very diverse political uh, political perspectives coming in the classroom, and I have never had a problem. That's never been a problem for me. Um, but what I do say at the beginning of the semester is that when we have discussions, we need to, you know, there are some parameters of the kinds of discussions you can have in this in this space. This is not your Facebook post. So I don't want to hear about Cheeto Jesus or whether you find Hillary, what you think about the quality of Hillary Clinton's voice. If you want to say something about the presidential candidates that are running for office, it needs to be something of intellectual substance, not about what they look like or you know these kind. That's not a, that's not a smart comment for a student to say in the seminar because that's not what we're talking about. So those are the kinds of things that I think. You know, you you direct the you direct the discussion as a professor and keep it civil. People know that they aren't they aren't aren't allowed to make just any old comment. Um, that's what I think of as a safe space. The other the other understanding of it is that it's a place where minority students or people who feel that they're not minority students can kind of gather and have these resources on campus. I mean, I don't I don't think people object to that. This notion that. Um, you know, the other thing is that I just want to say about this is that there, this idea of the, the gotcha culture, that you know everybody's afraid to speak because they're if they say the wrong thing, it's like oh gotcha as a bigot. Part of this is that the ways in which we talk about racism or classism or homophobia or whatever is that it's as an individual defect. And I think in this particular political moment, if we aren't able to talk about structural racism, um, stru you know, uh, homophobia, misogyny as larger uh, phenomenon, then that's a huge failing for us as professors. So I think that's part of it for me is that, you know, co constantly redirecting it to like, let's think about these things as not as like individual features of a personality if somebody says the wrong thing, that that's you know, what we're trying to look for. We're trying to think about these things as macro systems. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think this is a little off the point, I think, but I think, I think one of the issues that we have to confront as we go forward is the impact of social media on um, open discussion. Um, it used to be the case that you could have a conversation in a classroom or in a dorm or among colleagues um, in which you said things that were provocative, and it could be about, you know, I think abortion is murder, or I think abortion is good, or it doesn't matter what it was. You, you have a conversation, you knew some of the people in the room wouldn't like it, um, but you'd argue about it, and then it would go away. And with social media, what's happened is that we all become vulnerable to those conversations being out there forever and accessible by, you know, graduate schools and by employers and by dates. Uh, potential dates, I should say. Um, and I, I think that has a, a really uh, serious potential to undermine the willingness of individuals both here and throughout society to speak openly and to challenge things and to talk candidly. Um, and that worries me a lot about uh, its impact upon the academic community more generally. I don't know what the answer to that is, because I think it's a, re it's a reality, but I think it's something we have to begin thinking about. I, I would just say, you know, the, the image of the, uh, Nancy Kanner's image of the universities uh, as, as cities, in some ways, uh, I've always thought of them more as towns, that, uh, because they, cities are, I, I, you know, with Louis Worth, places of anonymity and uh, kind of anomie and so forth, whereas most universities, at least I think good residentially based universities, are collectivities that are more like towns where it's very hard to be anonymous, and, it's, and, and therefore the the, the, this notion of engendering community, it, it, has to, it, it has to happen in the classroom, but it has to happen in many other places as well. Um, and the, um, we found, for example, the, uh, uh, Chicago was very late in coming to uh, foreign study programs. There was a view 20 years ago that if you made it to the University of Chicago, you'd made it to the, kind of the world's greatest university, and why would you want to leave Hyde Park? Uh, what could you possibly learn in Paris or Beijing or, or, or South Africa or any place else? Uh, we, we find actually we have now a, a, a very broad and very rich probably within the Ivy Plus group, the largest group of foreign study programs. Where if you talk to the students that go on them, they, 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 it's not simply that they make new friends and, and people of very different backgrounds, ethnic, racial, religious, and so forth, encountering different cultures. Uh, uh, it's not just that, but it's also the fact that they're taken out of one kind of known environment and put in a totally foreign and different environment. In some ways, 
what we need, it seems to me, especially with educating young people, is to engender and strengthen these communities, but always to, the, the, the work is never over. You can't just do it with freshmen and say it's done for four years. And, and, um, it's because it's just like the population of a town, they come and they go. It's, it's like a stream going forward. Um, but I, 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 I think the, um, th this work of community is very important, but it can't all be put in the classroom. It, it has to, a lot of it has to be done beyond the classroom. Yeah, and, and in her remarks, she actually goes on to say that this, this city is made up of neighborhoods. And so students are mostly experiencing the neighborhood, however that might be defined, that they are interacting with engaging with, if, with, within the larger city of the large complex research university, which is what she was talking about. And I think that's where students often find their community um, and these larger spaces are places where maybe they're there for convocation or graduation, but their major interaction with the institution often is in these smaller neighborhoods rather than the larger, larger system. And I think, yeah, I mean, I think thinking about the hidden curriculum, the implicit curriculum, the co-curricular, and the curricular, these are all things, whether you're talking about graduate students or undergraduate students, these are all components of how they're experiencing the, these, the institutions in which we work. Thank you. Okay, so now I'm going to transition us to the informal part of our evening. We're going to invite you to dialogue together. So as moderator, I am not going to wrap this up in a nice bow. And I'm going to leave us with more, hopefully, questions to want to engage each other in. So we invite you to dialogue with each other around these issues, ask questions, share your reflections, say out loud ideas that are half-baked or that you're still struggling to fully form. Simply ask another person what still stands out to them in the, what a panelist says. What are you left wanting to talk more about? Part of practicing free expression, I think, is listening carefully to what another person is saying before you form your own response. It also means being humble and open this is hard to practice, or maybe I'm just speaking about myself. And allowing your response and even your own ideas to be shaped by what another person has just said to you. Practicing this interpersonal attunement is a critical component to our abilities as a community to authentically dialogue about issues and topics that matter deeply to each of us personally, not just professionally. I look forward to joining the panelists as we step from the safe place of our platform up here and separation from with you, um, which also provides a little bit of distance to now become co-participants in a dialogue. We also hope you enjoy the refreshment. So please.